Welcome to the Caffeine Podcast, specially brewed for Kiwi startup founders. I'm Fiona Rotherham from Caffeine, which is a community hub for Kiwi startup founders. Kicking off the Caffeine Podcast is a series Seed to Success, about building and backing Kiwi startups, and it's brought to you by New Zealand Growth Capital Partners. The series showcases Kiwi startups with potential for high growth across different sectors, giving insights on what it takes to build a successful company from New Zealand and just how much of a hard slog it can be. Today we're talking with Leila de Costos, the CEO and founder of pet supplements company Hale Animal Health, and Marion Johnson, who heads up the Ministry of Awesome in Christchurch. Welcome everybody, and thanks for listening in. I'd just like to begin, ladies, if you can give us a sort of short pricey of who you are and what your company does, so just a little bit about you. Um, Perhaps you could kick us off, uh, Leila. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Hale Animal Health and uh, Hale are developing uh, novel therapeutics for companion animals. Um, we identified a, a problem in the animal health space where the uh, the pain medications that are currently available to pet cats and dogs um, have some really bad side effects. And so we are developing a cannabis-derived registered veterinary medicine that will treat pain just as well as conventional medicines, uh, but without those side effects. And you, Marion? Uh, so Ministry of Awesome is a startup hub, and we work with high-growth startup founders across the country. Um, we run a number of different programs, Founder Catalyst, which is our incubator, Electrify Accelerator, which is our accelerator, and also we put on the Electrify Aotearoa Women's Founder Conference, um, which is this year in Wellington on the 19th of June, and this will be our third year doing that. Okay, thanks. Lola, I'm always really int- intrigued by where founders come up with their ideas for a company. So mm-hmm. can you tell us a bit about how you came up with this con- concept? Yeah. Uh, well, well, I always say the inspiration came from my very first baby who was born with a tail. Uh, she was also born furry and she was a New Zealand hunt across, uh, hunterway crossed with a Labrador uh, dog. And um, when I've my husband, a Labrador. <laughs> oh, you have a Labrador? Yep. Nice. Do you have a, a chocolate? A, yeah, chocolate one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Me too. Um, do you have a chocolate as well? No, no, golden. Oh, you've got golden. Yeah. <laughs> I'm currently looking at puppy options at the moment and I'm trying to decide. I, I think I'm firmly in the Labrador camp, but I'm still trying to decide, do I want the black, the golden or the chocolate? It's a very hard decision. <laughs> go for triplets. Yeah, one of each. Oof, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, um, her name was Sassy and uh, when my husband and I decided to move to the UK, we took Sassy with us. Um, we got her a little pet passport and the three of us lived in the UK together for six years. And whilst we were living over there, Sassy got older and she started to suffer from some of the aches and pains that dogs typically do in their elderly years. She had also developed, unfortunately, a liver condition. And so we were quite limited in terms of what we were able to give her and conventional painkillers weren't really an option. So that sort of led us down the path of exploring alternative options um, and led to a real interest and passion around medicinal cannabis um, and then sort of, yeah, fast forward a bunch of years and, and here we are developing medicinal cannabis for pets uh, and planning to register it as a veterinary medicine. But what's your background that would lead you being able to do this? Because, you know, I might have that as a great idea, but, you know, I can write, but I don't think I could do a medicines company. So, so yeah. you know, what's your background? Well, um, yeah, my background is in advertising, marketing and brand building. So definitely not a background of developing pharmaceutical <laughs> medicines for animals. Um, however, that background of mine, um, I have spent nearly 15 years um, working on behalf of my clients to help them achieve commercial success. Uh, and so, um, you know, obviously those skills are transferable. Uh, in terms of developing animal pharmaceuticals, that is where I've had to build um, a really solid team around me. Um, and it's perhaps probably one of the things that I'm most proud of um, in terms of our achievements to date uh, is that the team that I've built um, at Hale really feels like sort of best in class in the APAC region for developing uh, registered medicines for pets. As I understand it, you're at clinical trial status. Can you sort of catch us up, you know, where, where things are at with your milestones? Yeah. So we just completed um, a clinical trial just before Christmas, actually, um, and the results um, were pretty amazing. It actually um, kind of surprised even me. Um, so it was a double-blinded uh, clinical trial, which means that neither the pet owners or the dog owners nor the vet that was doing the examinations knew whether the animal had been prescribed our cannabis medicine or whether they had been prescribed the control. 
And the control is a product called um, Metacam, which the active ingredient is Meloxicam, which is really the gold standard um, pain medication at, um, in the you know Asia Pacific region and also in the UK and many countries around the world. Um, and our product performed just as well as that product. Um, and actually, to give a bit more context, we had a 93% success rate with our treatment group. Um, and many of the products that are currently on the market and registered medicines on the market at the moment only achieved somewhere between a 50 to 60% um, success rate in their clinical trials. So getting a hitting a 93% success rate is pretty um, pretty out of this world. It's pretty amazing results. We're pretty chuffed with that. How did you celebrate? Oh, well, it was right before Christmas. So it was a pretty hectic time of year, actually. Um, so uh, we probably didn't quite take the time to celebrate that we should have, which I think is typical of many founders. Um, you know, you do need to celebrate the wins. Uh, so maybe I still need to plan something around that. What do you think about that, Marion? Do you see with your startup founders, do they take, you know, they're so busy, busy, busy. Do they actually take the time to sit back and say, hey, we've actually achieved something. That's, that's a, something we can take off. I mean, I think that's something that we can all do a little bit more of, but absolutely with founders because they have such mountains to climb um, just because they get one extra step up doesn't doesn't uh, allow them to kind of stop and, and, and take stock. Most people are just concentrating on the next step and the next step on the next step. Um, and I think probably the first time people start to celebrate is, I guess, acquisition of your first customer and then your first um, investment. Those are probably the big the big moments. But for Layla, that that incredible piece of research really just underpins all of it, everything that she's been trying to prove in terms of the credibility of the product um, and um, and the potential for any investor. So you should be celebrating. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I know, but it is really on to the next thing. I mean, there's just a you know the ever growing to do list, isn't there? But um, so what is the next thing? Oh my goodness. Well, at the moment we are um, actively raising capital. So we are in fundraising mode. Uh, and to Marion's point, actually this uh, the latest clinical trial data um, has really helped with investment conversations. So we're now getting an audience with um, some really exciting and um, offshore investors that perhaps wouldn't have been quite ready to talk to us just yet. Um, but they've seen that clinical trial data um, and um, yeah, and we're into some pretty exciting discussions with them. Um, we we do also have a lead investor that's come on board, um, and so we're looking for um, other co contributors at the moment to help us hit our target um, before we close out this raise. Um, so that's um, yeah, that's the next thing, but it's a, it's also an ongoing thing uh, for us as well. So this is your first company. How stressful have you found that um, fundraising process? Yeah, the fundraising process has been probably one of the biggest challenges. Um, I think for us, we're at a really um, exciting intersection of industries, um, which means we are very novel. Um, but it also means that a lot of investors don't really have a deep understanding of what it is that we're doing. So you've got that sort of nascent medicinal cannabis um, industry that's um, you know with with that can be a bit controversial and with regulations that are sort of constantly evolving. And then you've got the animal health industry coming together with that and and going down that path of registered um, medicinal products as well, um, which is a very capital heavy pathway. Um, and so um, we're not your sort of typical investment opportunity, um, but that is also what makes us exciting as well. Marion, what advice do you give startup founders when they are about to look for investment? Are there some sort of tips that you give them or...? Does it vary depending on the startup founder and the business? I mean, first of all, they really have to be ready for investment. Um, that's the first thing. So many people will come in so early and they just don't have, they don't have enough, um, they don't have enough product market fit signals. Um, they don't have necessarily a really well-defined value proposition. Um, they haven't really done the research in um, the target markets that they need to do to understand what the competitive landscape is. So too early is one major problem. Um, but the if if you are if if you are in the right place, then I think it's really making sure that your narrative is extremely clear around that targeting, the value proposition, the market that you're going to be hitting, how you're going to hit it, and why you are exactly um, the team. That, that that should be embarking on this and who will have success where others have where others have failed. Um, sometimes that's not as clear as it needs to be. Um, sometimes it's a little too vague. 
Um, but I think also the piece that's missing is doing some really good research on the people that you're pitching to, to see exactly what they're interested in and what they've invested in previously. Because if Layla went and saw a, you know, a group of angels who, who essentially had invested in nothing but SaaS products, it's really unlikely she's going to have any success with, you know, with this. I mean, that's obvious, isn't it? Mm. Um, but being able to sort of look at what's in their portfolio and sort of say why something might be relevant or something, you know, might be similar or might capture their passion in a similar way. Um, that's also really good um, intel to collect before you um, start your pitching process. Yeah. And, then, and in your case, have you sort of stalked them a bit on Facebook to see if they do have a dog or a cat? <laughs> yeah, that's um, that definitely helps. I think if people have, you know, have pets or have animals and have that emotional bond, then um, yeah, those people are definitely often more interested in, in what we're up to than others. But I think, Marion, to your point, you know, that doing the research in advance, because we sort of, I sort of started out the process having not really raised capital previously, the sort of shotgun approach of just, um, you know, if you can get an audience, then pitch. But I think um, carefully, you know, choosing how you spend your time and who you spend your time on um, and, and spending it with the ones that are most likely to, you know, be interested in what you're doing and, uh, is really important because you can spend a lot of time having a lot of conversations with investors that would just, just you, you just don't hit their mandate, don't tick the right boxes, that sort of thing. Yeah. 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 So, Lola, um, you took part, part in the Electrify Accelerator last year. Yeah. Marion, can I get you to talk a bit about Electrify and what it is and, and what you're trying to achieve with it? Sure. So in New Zealand, um, we kind of, we mirror the rest of the world in the sense that we don't have as many women founders as we need to have in our, in our pipeline and in our ecosystem. Um, in New Zealand, four out of five teams are all male founders um, and one out of five teams has a woman founder in it. Um, and then when, and that's, that's very similar to the rest of the world, including North America and much more mature startup markets. So um, that is not a New Zealand only problem. Um, and it becomes even uh, more stark when you start looking at the amount of venture capital that is deployed to um, uh, women founded companies. Uh, and I'm sure you guys have seen all the stats, but I mean, the really the big takeaway is that 83% of all venture capital um, is generally going to all male founder teams. And this is so important, not just from an equity and, you know, from a fairness perspective, but it also means that our future is being created by these knowledge intensive companies. And if that's the case, and 83% of the ones who are getting funded are all male, well then, you know, uh, women founders are not in the equation. Um, and so I think this is a, it's a serious society. It's a, a serious societal problem. Um, and when we looked at that from the Ministry of Awesome perspective, it actually was three years ago when I looked around um, our startup hub and I saw two women founders and 16 guy founders. Um, and this was because one of the VCs was coming to town and wanted to do a women founder breakfast. And I just thought, how the hell did that happen? Um, and once I started looking into it, um, we decided we were going to do something about it. So the first thing we did was the Electrify Aotearoa event, which is a women founders summit. And that was the first one was two years ago in Christchurch. Um, last year, we were at Sky City in Auckland. We had 500 women, 500 tickets sold out, 200 on the wait list. And pretty much the entire startup ecosystem was there. Um, and it was an incredible thing to see. And the whole goal of that was not just to do like a great big high five event, um, but to essentially do three things. The first one is making startups a thing, and that means role modeling. So role modeling with successful founders, um, people who are either slightly ahead or way ahead, um, who are women founders who are doing really well in the New Zealand and global market, so that people who are already on the journey can see that, yep, they can achieve it too. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, a guy wearing a hoodie from Stanford, you know, faffing around with code. You know, there are other other founders out there. Um, and then the second piece was really about building capabilities. So we had a number of master classes around, for example, um, investment in the process for getting investment, um, how to commercialize deep tech, um, path to market, building a brand. So it was really targeted for people who are either hadn't started their journey, were early in their journey, midway through their journey, 
um, but essentially building capability um, around uh, that space. And then the last um, big goal was really just creating a community because if women founders could connect with other women founders, then they could get the support that they need. And we know from you know working in our startup hub and doing the incubators and the accelerators that we do across the country, that actually there's nothing more relevant and more helpful for a startup founder than to be working with another startup founder to understand you know w- what was successful for them what and and to share you know share tips and share journeys and share investor memorandums and all that kind of stuff is um, is something that really keeps founders going on on what a, on what a, is a really difficult journey. So that was the purpose behind this. Um, and then as a result of that, we also pulled it, uh, an, a, an accompanying accelerator together, which is only for women founders. So high growth women founders in Altero. And that's where we met Layla in uh, last year's cohort. So how did you find the accelerator, Layla? Was it great mixing with people like yourself? Yeah, it was. Um, I had never done an accelerator or anything like that before. So I didn't really know what to expect. Uh and it was it was great to build out that network, uh, not just amongst other founders where you could sort of share war stories and the highs and lows, um, but also just that network of, you know, all of the mentors and business coaches and things that agree to partake in the accelerator. They're all such a high caliber and many of those people are people that you wouldn't get time with otherwise. Um, and so, yeah, that was a huge plus for me taking part in the accelerator. And Marion, now you've actually sort of forged ahead and done something. Have you found other people in the ecosystem are wanting to help you um, support you with this as well? Oh, absolutely. I mean, everybody recognises this is an issue. The funny thing is, though, is is that people keep saying um, that they need more women founders to invest in. The quality of the women founders isn't strong enough, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why they don't have a lot of investment in women founders Um, And so, I mean, on one hand, yes, we need to have more women founders in the pipeline. But on the other hand, I completely disagree with the fact that with with this idea that um, there that the women founders who are are, who are out there are not high enough quality to invest in. Um, I I think we should all follow Layla's journey carefully because there are all sorts of different resources where. There are dollars that are actually attributed to the kind of work that she is doing where you would expect an investment. And I'd like to understand why that investment may or may not transpire. I'm not trying to hex you, Layla. <laughs> I'm just trying to just say close watch. Let's keep this as transparent, you know, as we possibly can. Mm. I'm really curious about what products you're going to have. So, you know, mm. obviously it's for, you're looking at dogs and cats, but what's what sort of other products are on the sort of your first horizon? Yeah. So the first product is uh, specifically registered to treat pain in dogs that are so- suffering from osteoarthritis. Um, we go for a very specific label claim because then that reduces the scope of what we need to prove in, in our clinical trials, which are already um, pretty lofty and expensive things to do. Um, but it, but once that product's registered, vets are able to um, use what's known as off-label in the veterinary community, which means that uh, it can be used uh, for um, any type of chronic or um, acute pain. Uh, it can also be used for things like stress and anxiety. Uh, And actually, really interestingly, in our most recent trial that I mentioned, one of the sort of anecdotal pieces of feedback that we got from a lot of the dog owners was that they had noticed a real reduction in the anxiety levels of their dogs. Um, And so that's something I'm really keen to dive into a little bit more um, because that's quite an exciting use for this product as well. Um, I was going to say, do you have the same regulatory hurdles that that you would if if this was a human product? Yeah, I get asked that a lot. And uh, as surprisingly, um, the regulatory hurdles for animal health are higher than what they are for human health. And I think the justification for that is because humans are able to do their own research and make their own decisions, whereas animals are not. So as you all probably are aware that um, there is a medicinal cannabis industry for humans already here in New Zealand, you are able to go and get a prescription and to get medicinal cannabis products. Um, those products being sold for humans are sold as what are called um, Section 29 drugs or also known as unapproved medicines, which means that they haven't had to go through a registration process and they haven't had to undergo clinical trials. Um, so it's at the discretion of the user and of the GP prescribing um, to make that decision to use it, 
We don't have that option in animal health. In animal health, we have to register the product. And in order to register the product, we have to go through clinical trials to prove that it's safe and to prove that it's effective. Um, so it is more difficult with more hurdles um, in animal health than human health. And um, do you have a timeline for when you hope to get a product to market? Uh, yes, uh, we have clinical trials, uh, more clinical trials this year, uh, and then some more next year, and then we will be registering after that. So, yeah, we're probably around 18 to 24 months away from registration. What's been your biggest hurdle so far? What, have, what sort of kept you awake at night and thought, oh, oh no, why did I do this? Uh, oh, well, I think the biggest hurdle has been um, that capital raising um, and, yeah, investment. Um, that has been a real challenge. Um, not only are we um, in that kind of interesting sort of space that I mentioned around animal health pharmaceuticals all combined with cannabis, um, we are, we're pre-revenue still, um, and uh, yeah, so that has um, that has been a challenge. But um, the more progress that we're making um, with you know the development of um, filing our patent, which is uh, about to happen, and um, our clinical trial results and everything, and having our lead investor on board now as well, uh, that is all all getting a lot easier. Uh, and um, clinical trials and R and D, I think its very nature has its ups and downs. So R and D can. Things can happen that you weren't expecting and um, curveballs can come your way. So it's just being able to um, yeah, be resilient, I think, with those sorts of things. Um, you talked about it requiring a lot of, a lot of money. Mm. Um, could you give you know, folks listening an, an idea of what a clinical trial would cost? So, so just one trial alone? Yep. Um, so one trial alone could cost you anywhere from 700 grand to 1.2, 1.5 million, depending on the size of the trial. Um, and uh, to what requirements you're doing it to as well. So uh, we have the US market and registration with the FDA is firmly in our sites. Uh, and so our clinical trials are being done to FDA standards, um, which does add you know, significant um, kind of requirements. Um, and so you just need to uh, yeah, plan for that, plan for that capital pathway. So how much are you looking to raise? This raise that we're doing at the moment, we have a target of two million New Zealand uh, dollars. We have our lead investors bringing one point three million of that to the round. Uh, so we're just in discussions with other contributors at the moment for the remaining seven hundred. Um, the next raise after that will probably be a similar amount, around another two and a half to three million. Um, and then we we may look at a Series A raise further down the track in line with entering into the the US. So New Zealand's your, your initial market and then US? Yeah, we're, we're looking at doing a sort of a staged approach to tackling the US um, because it is the highest hurdle um, probably globally for achieving registration. Uh, and so we'll be looking to enter into some key markets being New Zealand, Australia, some parts of Asia, South America, um, basically other countries that have a similar um, registration requirements to New Zealand and Australia uh, where we can use the data package that we would have generated through our clinical trials. Uh, those will be the initial markets that we will enter into. And then off the back of those markets and generating revenue in those markets, um, we'll be paving the way to using that data to pave the way towards that FDA registration. Marion, do you find that um, women founders in your experience have been as um, global oriented as their male counterparts? I mean, are they, are they keen to tackle the world and, and take on those markets? I don't think there's really a difference once they have once they have done a, a real check on the landscape and what their total addressable markets could be and so on. But I think that what happens is that with 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 New Zealand founders, we have such a large percentage of our women founders who are looking at B2C um, type of products. And as a result of that, there's an automatic break because we're not talking about lightweight products. Generally, we're talking about, you know, we're not talking about digital products. We're not necessarily talking about SaaS. That's not to say there aren't a ton of women founders with, you know, SaaS products. It's just that at the moment with the volume in our pipeline, there is a lot in the sort of FMCG space. And so it necessarily becomes a whole lot more complicated once you start looking at export um, but having said that, we have at least a handful of the founders who came through that last cohort from our accelerator who do have uh, FMCG, FMCG products who are exporting or looking to export. Um, so that was a little bit of a confused answer, but I think, no, not really. I think once they get into it and scope out and they understand that the world is their oyster, 
then they're able to, um, you know, smash it out just like anyone else might. And in terms of the support that you're giving female founders, is there anything um, different to that than that would be for a male founder or, or do they want similar things? I think they want very similar things. It's much more around uh, making sure that in the program that there's a heavy weighting of uh, women mentors, other women founders who have been there and done that, who can um, give the um, the cohort who are earlier on in the piece the confidence that they might need or the networks that they might need to succeed. I think that's even more important in a Women Founders Accelerator than anything else. Um, I also think that to some extent there is um, a bit of a job to be done around um, mindset and um, a lot more work to be done around investment and pitching because really most of the, I mean, women founders aren't doing great in terms of getting capital. And I would say that 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 is largely because of the other side of the table. Um, But nonetheless, they need to learn how to navigate that. Um, They need to learn, you know, how, how they might put their best foot forward um, and and deal with some of the objections that they might receive. And that's very similar to um, gender pay parity, isn't it? That you don't you don't get what you don't ask for. So it's it's about being confident in, in what you're asking for, isn't it? What, yeah. What's your view on that, Leila? Mm. Yeah, definitely confidence in what you're asking for. And um, I don't I don't. It's hard for me to answer that question because I feel like I don't have the other experience for which to compare to what it's like being not being a woman founder. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I think just knowing your stuff and, you know, being prepared to, you know, have all of the questions fired at you and answer them confidently and and be passionate about what you're doing and excited and um, really stand behind what it is you're doing, yeah, with that confidence and excitement. Is there someone you look up to, a particular founder that you think, you know, that's that's a, a really well-run business, I'd, I'd like to be like that one day? Oh my goodness, um, putting me on the spot here. Um, I think a whole bunch of people spring to mind for you know various different reasons. Um, I wouldn't, there's no one name in particular that um, I can think of right now, but um, definitely a bunch of um, people from different industries. Um, I have some uh, mentors that are sort of guiding me through this process that I'm, you know, with this company that I've founded now. Um, and I really do look up to them in terms of, um, you know, what they've managed to achieve in, in previously and how they built their businesses and things. So those mentors are um, founders themselves. Is that what you find most useful? Yeah, I, I think so. And the one mentor in particular who built a, um, an animal health company uh, here in New Zealand that started off quite small and grew to be a very large global success. And, um, and you know, I've built a pretty close relationship with him over the past few years. And um, he has a lot of time for me and um, he's just so helpful. You can name and- him. <laughs> I'm not sure if you'd want me to, so <laughs> I, I, I didn't ask guess. in advance. So. <laughs> Fair enough. So you've got mentors that are helping you on the journey. Um, you also mentioned teams. So how hard has it been recruiting who you want into, into a sort of, as you say, a pre-revenue startup? Yeah, um, it has been not challenging getting people excited about what we're doing, but challenging for, uh, perhaps finding the very sp- specific skill sets and experience that is needed. Um, so, you know, the formulation and chemistry, you know, side of what we're doing. There's the whole regulatory side of what we're doing, taking taking it through to registration um, and then the different regulatory and registration requirements in the different markets. So it, it is very specialist skill sets um, that we've needed. Uh, but that's where I've been really lucky with some of those mentors and some of those, uh, that network as well as uh, sort of being able to bring in those people that have built their careers off the back of doing exactly that. So been pretty lucky with finding the right people. Marion, is there anything that you would um, say people could help support female founders better? You know, is there anything people could do? Um, I think, first of all, there, there, there needs to be, and there certainly is developing a much broader awareness around the inequity in that sort of investment um, uh, piece. It is, it, is so, it is so profoundly lopsided um, and I think that when investment committees get together, they need to be really clear on exactly what they need to do around the table to rectify that. And if that means they need to have more pipeline, if that needs they need if that means they need to do more ecosystem or community work in order to find those incredible women founders, 
then they need to go out there and do that. They can't just say, oh, well, there aren't any, and that's why we don't invest in them, because there are. They're everywhere. I think that's the first piece. I think the second piece is making sure that we have more representation around investment committees. There are incredibly powerful and capable investors who are women who are starting to join more investment committees and who are in positions where they can make those investment decisions. But they too, just because they're women, doesn't mean that they they don't have the same role model blindness um, you know, that others do. Um, so they themselves need to be aware and they need to be proponents for uh, for women founders. And I think the other thing that we really need to do is we need to get more women investing um, in this space and even even small check as angels or small check as contributions to funds, um, just starting to look at that space and getting excited ab- about women founded businesses is, I think, a very important step. One thing that really resonated for me and has resonated every time I've heard this because I've heard it so many times is that quite frequently women founders with um, businesses across a multitude of sectors will be solving for a problem that is classically a woman problem. So that might be anything inside the house, you know, (laughs) anything. And that includes children, includes animals, includes anything. Um, And for some reason, it's a women thing. And so therefore, the investors around the table kind of go, oh, well, that's not my, it's like, I don't, I don't know that thing. I am not. Which is crazy when you consider most women have control of the household budget. It is crazy. It is crazy. But, you know, (laughs) this is something we could discuss endlessly, Fiona. But I think it's a, it's a, it's an education that needs to happen. And it's a diversification that needs to happen around the tables where the decisions are being made. And that it's an awareness piece that everyone needs to understand that you may have lots of women friends, but you yourself may have a problem. Mm. And do you think that some uh, more statistics around this would be helpful? Because I know Teresa Gatting and Jenny Rudd did some work um, last year on this, but would it be good if, if we had more sort of gathering statistics to sort of back this up rather than anecdotal? Absolutely. I mean, you know that with my other hat on, I was part of that startup council that was created about a year a year ago, and we put a report together. And I think the number one thing that we need to step into um, with regards to that report, I mean, not number one, the ESOP thing was probably number one, but okay, let's say number three, is making sure that the data that we have around the startup ecosystem is up to date and consistently gathered and is consistently um, correct. Because these numbers that I'm throwing out, the 83%, the 2% for these people, the 15%, I mean, these are global. I mean, that's a figure from, I think it was a Bain & Co. study from 2021. Um, And I know there was an update in 2023. um, And unfortunately, we didn't do any better. In fact, if I recall correctly, we actually went down in terms of the percentage. Um, But nonetheless, we need to have that for the New Zealand market because the work that we're doing is right here for the New Zealand market. And how can we press on how can we press on the levers and use the right tactics if we don't even know exactly how big the problem is and measure whether or not we've been successful? So to me, that's just a no brainer. So Jenny Rudd and Teresa Gatting, just referencing their earlier you know, white paper that they, that they had done around um, the data for women founders from the New Zealand Growth Capital Partners numbers and the Enterprise Angels numbers. It wasn't wide enough, but it was certainly indicative and you could fill in the gaps, but there's no reason why we can't have all investors Um, putting those numbers into um, these data sets so that we can see a little bit more clearly how we're doing. And that doesn't have to be just measuring women founders. It also could be how much are we investing in deep tech? How much are we investing in each of the sectors under deep tech? How much are we investing in SaaS, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. And I'd just like to finish, Layla, on what advice would you give for another female founder starting out? I know you're still fairly uh, early on your journey mm. for yourself, but if you know if you were seeing someone uh, in, in the very em- embryonic stage, what, what advice would you have? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if it's female-specific advice, but advice for, for any founder, I think it applies, is um, be prepared for the roller coaster. Um, it is uh, a roller coaster ride founding a business. Um, the highs are, are really high, but the lows can be pretty low. Um, so um, make sure you've built a high tolerance for stress um, and uh, really work on your resilience. And um, if you get knocked down, just yeah, get ready to get back up again and keep going. How do you de stress? 
well, I think um, in my kind of previous career, my advertising days, that's a pretty um, high stress kind of industry. So I think I had sort of already got to the point where I was uh, used to dealing with, able to deal with high stress. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's that being able to kind of decompartmentalize and switch your mind elsewhere and not let it wander back uh, constantly when you're in your in your free time. Uh, and I'm sure the furry animals help with it. The furry animals help with that. I've got a pretty uh, busy home life these days with two little kids as well. That certainly is a big distraction um, and uh, and a good way to switch my mind off from work um, at the end of the day. Um, and uh, yeah, just, you know, your regular stuff like, you know, time with friends and family. And um, I've just dusted off my Kindle recently, started reading a book. Um, so yeah, to give my, my mind somewhere else to go. So um, yeah, things like that and being being aware of your mental health and that, you know, if you need to do a bit extra, if you are starting to feel a bit run down. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thanks everyone to listening in and to Leila De Costa and Marion Johnson for your conversation today. I've enjoyed it. And special Thank thanks for, uh, to NZGCP for sponsoring the series. I'm uh, Fiona Rotherham from Caffeine Matewa. Thanks, Fiona. Thanks.